Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Um, tonight's lecture will be, in a sense, a continuation of the last two. The last two lectures we talked about circumcision and all the ideas concerning it. Um, I'd like to continue with that uh, in, at a bris, at a circumcision. Uh, there's a blessing that is given to the parents. I'd like to start with that and follow some ideas from there. So again, at the circumcision, there is a blessing is given to the parents of the baby boy. And the blessing is, Kishem shenichnas lebris kein yikonis latorah chupa maisem tovim. Translates to mean, just as you have brought him, meaning the young baby boy, to a circumcision, so too should you merit to bring him into Torah, marriage, and good deeds. Now, the question becomes, where is the origin of this blessing? So I believe we can learn it out from Yitzchak, our father. He was the first male to be circumcised when he was eight days old. This blessing was completed when Eliezer, the servant of Avram, came to Lavan's house to find a wife for Yitzchak. Uh, when Eliezer first sees Rivka, she is drawing water from the well. And we know that water is an allusion to Torah, so we have that. His purpose in being there was to find a wife for Yitzchak, which is chuppah. And she gave him the drink and also watered all of his camels, in allusion to the concept of what we call gemilas chasadim, which alludes to, again, maisim tovim, good deeds. Now, it's not just Yitzchak's marriage that's by a well. We also see that Yaakov found his wife at a well in the book of Bereshit, in the portion of Vayetze, chapter 29. And also in that case, we can connect it also to the threefold blessing of Torah, Chupa, and maisim tovim. Um, this, that he uh, came again to marry the Torah, which he had. He was a Tepen Torah. He came to find a wife. That's because both his mother and father had sent to Lovin's house for that purpose. And Maisim told him good deeds. He rolled the stone from the top of the well, which allowed them to water their sheep. Again, the same idea. A third time, we see the same scenario can be seen with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, and his first encounter with Sipora, who would be his wife. Uh, he met her at the well, and again, he married her. This is all found in the book of Shemos, in the portion, in chapter 2. And again, Moshe Bino, again, he had Torah, Chupa, and he came, when he came to the well, the daughters of Yisra were being harassed by the shepherds. Moshe Bino chased them away and then also watered their sheep. Now, the blessing is really not given to the child, but it's given to the parents of the child. On a very simple level, what it is is we are blessing the parents that just as they have had the merit to bring their son into the covenant of Abraham, of Abraham, so too should they merit to bring him into Torah, Chupa, marriage, and Maisim Tobim, good deeds. Now, another allusion, allusion to this may be that just as his circumcision is forever, so too should his Torah, his marriage, and good deeds also last forever. In addition, just as a circumcision was done without any ulterior motive, after all, he's only eight days old, a mitzvah done completely for God, so too should all of his mitzvot be done, the Shema, completely for God. Now, this blessing also alludes to levels of development in the life of a person. In his parents' house, again, his parents should teach him Torah. Again, his parents should help him with the next stage of life, finding him a proper mate, in a sense, making him leave the nest, so to speak, chupa. And then the final stage of leaving his own self-centered goals and becoming a true giver. One level up, again, my symptom of good deeds. However, the order of the blessings are really incorrect. It really should be Torah, my symptom, good deeds, and then chupa, then marriage. Why is it that it is... Um, Torah, then chupa, marriage, and then good deeds. The order seems to be reversed. So when we become Bali Chuva, when we accept God's Torah, his dominion in the world, but we, even though we've accepted Torah, in reality we are still selfish individuals. Torah doesn't stop a person from being self-centered. But then we get married, chupa. The circle kind of widens and we allow a spouse to enter into our domain. And with marriage, we hopefully learn the concept of compromise, shara, 
which becomes very important for a person in life. And the last blessing of Maisim Tovim, good deeds, allude to children. We learn the concept from children of what we call bittel, self-nullification. It's amazing. For once in a person's life, we actually want someone else to be first, for someone to get the bigger piece, to be better than us. I remember someone once told me about my son, that he had a better voice than I did, and he was really trying to give me a little shtick, and I took it as a great compliment. Uh, being a parent, the Gemara says the two people you don't, you're not jealous of is a student and a child. And I'm not sure about a student, but a child for sure. We definitely want the child even better than us. Now all of these concepts allude in reality to our relationship and our service of God. Now, the Ramah in Yoridea 265.12 states on another idea that whoever does not participate in the festive meal that accompanies a bris, a circumcision, is viewed as if he is excommunicated from heaven. He adds that if offensive people are participating in such a meal, then one is not obligated to join them. So when we make a bris, it is customary not to invite people directly. Rather than saying to a person, you are invited to the bris, what we do is we kind of beat around the bush a little. We say the bris will take place on such and such a day at such and such an hour. And this is done so that if the guest is unable to attend the ceremony, his declining the invitation will not be interpreted as a refusal to take part in a festive meal. However, there are opinions that dispute this ruling and argue that there is no problem in inviting people to a bris because the statement of the Ramah applies only to guests who are present at the bris and at the meal itself and refuse to take part in that meal. By doing so, they show their disdain for the mitzvah of Mila, which cannot be said for someone who is absent from the entire affair. The Shut Shel Nishel, in verse number 7, Yerodea 209, writes that this lenient ruling emerges from the wording of the Ramah himself who writes that someone who does not participate in the bris is considered as though excommunicated from heaven. In the next set sentence stating that where offensive people are present, one need not join the meal, implies that the reference is to someone that's actually present at the bris, at the meal. Now there are other opinions, the Kafa Chaim, in uh, Sefer 900, probably 90, uh, 67, that state that even if one is invited to a bris, he can decline based on that if he is needed to be part of a minion, a quorum of ten men someplace else. Again, Osep and Mitzvah, Pater and Mitzvah, one who is involved with the doing a good deed, is exempt from doing another one. There are also opinions that if there is already a quorum of ten adult Jewish men at the meal, then the guest is not obligated to take part, for the commandment will at any rate still be fulfilled without him, based on Otsara Bris, page 163. In addition, the sages encourage all to attend a bris, even if they weren't invited. For attending a bris is like greeting the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God. When one attends a bris, they receive what we call an Neshama Yaseira, an additional soul just like on the Shabbat. Then we also have belief the one who attends a bris has the opportunity to pray for all their needs since all their sins are forgiven. Amazing, they tell a story of uh, Roshlomer Kluger when he was a uh, new rabbi in Brody and uh, there was a bris that was supposed to take place in the morning and people were waiting around and they didn't start the bris and he asked why. And they said to him that the father was um, basically on his deathbed. And he, they felt that he may die any moment. And should he pass away, what they wanted to do is name this baby after the father. When he heard what they said, he, he quickly told them, no, no, don't do that. Do the bris right away. And bring the father. And they did that. Uh, again, they were a bit surprised, but they listened to what he said. And miraculously, somewhat, the father recovered. And they looked at him as a miracle worker. They said, how did you do this? And he said he's not a miracle worker. 
You said, but at a bris, one of the reasons why Eliyahu Nabi comes to the circumcision is to bless the baby and give the baby a refuah shalema, that a quick healing from the wound of the bris itself. And since he's there, anyone else that needs a refuah, needs a healing, is also in line for it. So the fact that the uh, father was brought to the bris, it was not a surprise to him. That was why he wanted the father brought, so that he could have a complete recovery, which he did. Now, in addition, we say, what about, we have to ask another question. So we see that there's a question with the bris of inviting someone because of the meal. What about other celebrations? And there are those who are of the opinion that one should be careful not to invite guests to a wedding or similar mitzvah meals. However, most people we see do send in wedding invitations with no compunction. They don't think about it at all. So one reason is that wedding invitations are not necessarily considered a sincere personal invitation that would trigger being ostracized by heaven. In fact, many people just send invitations in the hope that maybe they get a gift back. And, uh, you know, because they send it for people that are out of town, this, that, and the other, who they really have little idea of them coming. This is especially true today when people send invitations, really without expecting every person on their mailing list to attend. Others see a bris differently. Since Eliyahu Anabi, Elijah the prophet, attends the circumcision, and we know that God has commanded him to do so, that he comes to every circumcision, and by not participating in a circumcision, it may be seen as an insult to the honor of Elijah the prophet. Bottom line, especially because of the benefit of having one's sins forgiven and the fulfillment of a major precept, mitzvah of the Torah, one should at least try to attend any bris whenever possible. If you can't stay for the meal, at least which, with, which according to many is the main factor in the mitzvah, then what you should do is take some food with you and eat it later. And in this way, you've still participated in the meal again, which according to Ramah becomes the main part. And through the fulfillment and participation of this mitzvah, may we help to usher in the coming of the Mashiach Tzikenu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom.